All right. So. Page 14. Uh, we know that if we're looking at a derivative graph, that um, uh, we keep in mind that the y-axis represents the slope value of the original graph, not the position. So this is not the true shape of the of the original graph. This this is just the derivative graph. But we like we can label with uh, positive and negative slope and slope zero to help us uh, help remind us what we're looking at. So. We create a slope sign line by finding our x intercepts, so negative two, one, and five. And then we look to see whether our f prime is above or below the x axis. Above means positive slope, below means negative slope. And now we can get a picture as to what the actual shape of the graph will look like. The graph is going to rise, fall, rise, and rise again. Okay. Uh, f prime, f double prime, that's just, this is going to be your concavity sign line. Um, this is now going to be based off of um, your peaks and valleys. Right? Peaks and valleys of your F prime graph will be um, the points of inflection of your original graph. And then you look at the slope. The negative slope is going to translate to concave down. Positive slope will translate to concave up. And once you have your slope sign line, then it's easy because you're just reading uh, whatever the arrows and the symbols tell you to indicate wherever your original graph is rising or falling or relative max or relative min, and the intervals of concave up and concave down. OK, next up, uh, particle motion. Um, Particle motion problems actually it feels a lot like uh, creating your uh, first derivative test and your test for concavity, because um, instead of calling it f prime and f double prime, we're going to call um, uh, this uh, position uh, position velocity and acceleration. So velocity is kind of like your f prime, acceleration is kind of like your f double prime. So um, particle motion is motion along the x-axis involving the position, velocity, and acceleration. So just like how we set f prime to go to zero, we're going to find the derivative, except the derivative is now called velocity. But we set velocity equal to zero and find critical points. Um, this will tell us when the object is motionless or at rest. Right? We create a velocity sign line and place critical points on the sign line. And then we, we test each subinterval on the sign line and indicate positive for moving right or negative for moving left. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. If acceleration is positive, then velocity is decreasing. If acceleration is negative, then velocity is decreasing. If velocity and acceleration have the same signs, then the particle speed is increasing. If velocity and acceleration have opposite signs, then the particle speed is decreasing. So if we look at number five, it says, uh, for what value of t is the speed of the particle increasing? So increasing and um, decreasing speed, we have to find by comparing the signs between velocity and acceleration. So here, um, uh, because we want to look for increasing speed, we want to check to see where is velocity and acceleration going to have the same signs. So let's go ahead and create velocity and acceleration sign lines. So uh, find the derivative from position to velocity, set velocity equal to zero, we factor a three out, continue factoring, and we get one and seven. And then we test we find values in each subinterval to plug into the velocity function, and then positive would mean moving right, negative would mean moving left. We find the second derivative from velocity to acceleration, going through power rule. Set acceleration to go zero. We solve for t. We get t equals four. We test values in each subinterval here. Uh, one will give us a negative acceleration. Five will give us a positive acceleration. We line the two uh, velocity acceleration uh, sign lines. Uh, over each other, so we can kind of see when they're both going to be sharing the same sign. So we see um, they're both going to be negative in that interval from one to four. They'll also be negative. Oh, sorry, they'll also share the same signs from seven to infinity.
Okay, let's look at page 15. So uh, it says, uh, page 15 uh, says, the figure shows the graph of F on the interval from A to B, which of the following could be the graph of F prime, which is the derivative of F on the interval from A to B. So we have the graph of F now. We're looking for F prime. Um, so I'm going to create a slope and concavity sign line. Now this is going to be uh, exactly what you would expect is on this curve, because this is the original graph. So. Uh, you see your peaks and valleys here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, create some numbers here um, just so I can have something to work off of. So I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, just so I can have some frame of reference here. All this negative one. Okay, so if we had to guess, um, well, I, I think we can tell where the points of uh, the um, peaks and valleys, right? So we, we can expect max and mens to be there. We can kind of estimate where our points of inflections are. So points of inflection is where our concavity is going to change from concave up to concave down. So we can kind of imagine, okay, this looks like that could be a POI. Concave down to concave up, this could be a POI. Concave up to concave down, POI is here. And then finally, this is concave up, sorry, concave down, but then we can kind of see that the curvature changes here, right? This is kind of concave up shape. So we can call this. So all the ones in red are points of inflection. Uh, all the ones in black are my peaks and valleys, right? So um, here's what my F prime sign line is. So I'm going to say one, three, and five. So I know that my slope is positive up until one, negative from one to three, positive from three to five, and then negative from five on. Now my second derivative sign line, uh, points of inflection, I have negative one, two, four, and six. So I want the graph to start off with concave up, right? This portion is concave up. This is the original graph. So whatever the curvature looks like is, ex is exactly um, what we can do here. So concave up, changes to concave down, back to concave up. Concave down, and concave up. So we want a um, F prime graph to resemble all this information. So remember, if we want to get from F prime, now we know that we want peaks and valleys to be at negative one, two, four, and six, and we want our x intercepts to be at one, three, and five. So, um, So it looks like um, B maybe could be a good fit because I see um, peak at negative one here, um, peak at a uh, valley at two, four, six, and then X intercepts at positive, negative. So X intercepts at one, three, and five, right? So we start off with above the x axis, then below the x axis, then above, then below, and then concave. So positive slope to point of inflection, negative slope to the next point of inflection, positive slope, point of inflection, negative slope, positive slope. And so this is going backwards. This is uh, um, going from the original function to the f prime instead of f prime to the original function.
Okay, number two. In the XY plane, um, the point zero negative two is on the curve C. If the derivative dy dx is 4x over 9y, which of the following statements could be true? Okay, at point zero negative two, curve C has a relative minimum, okay, or relative minimum because of this, relative max. Uh, so we have different circumstances here. Um, if we're trying to prove something is um, relative max, relative min from the second derivative function, this is basically dealing with a uh, second derivative test. So let's go ahead and find the second derivative value. So I'm going to find the second derivative uh, function, plug 0, negative 2 in, get the second derivative value, and there, that way I know whether my second derivative is positive or negative. Okay. So here's my dy dx. We just have to be able to find the second derivative. OK, so to find the second derivative, we have to go through quotient rule. Or the next derivative down. So D2 Y over DX2 is another notation for a second derivative, so I'm going to go through a quotient rule here. So f prime, um, f 4x becomes 4. The g function doesn't change. Back to f and g prime. So 9, what does 9y become? Get 9 dy dx. All over my denominator squared. I'm going to replace. Yes. Oh, uh, well, yes, technically the four produces uh, dx over dx, but dx over dx is just one, so we, we don't really ignore it. So, yeah, so that's why we don't do anything special with x's unless it's related rates. If time is independent variable, then we have dx dt, dy dt, but this is just implicit. So, um, only y gets a, gets a special additional treatment. X is, um, um, doesn't have any impact. OK, so now we can replace every X and Y with, um, uh, with 0, negative 2. And then for dy dx, dy dx will be replaced with 4x over 9y, which if we plug in, it's just going to be um, 0 over negative 18, which is um, 0. OK, but I'm going to go ahead and just plug everything in here. So four times. Okay, the nice thing is that the zero is going to wipe everything out here. So that's going to wipe this term out. So actually the value is not that important. We just want to know whether it's positive or negative. This is going to be um, negative 72 uh, over um, squared. OK, so negative 72 over um, 324, which ends up giving us negative 2 over 9. But the important thing is that it's less than 0. That's the most important thing. Um, now, this negative 2 ninths, what does that tell us about the original graph here? If we see a negative second derivative value, what does that mean? What does the shape of the graph look like? OK, yeah, yeah, so that's the shape of the graph. Right, second derivative of less than zero concave down. So if we visualize what concave down looks like. 
then what, what do we expect from this point here? We can call this a what? Relative what? Max, right? So we know that A and B is out of the question. And then between C and D, relative max because second derivative is greater than zero, or is it relative max because second derivative is less than zero? Less than zero, yeah. So answer choice D. Okay, final page. We'll work through these problems together. Page 16, number three, the first derivative of the function is given by F prime. So we have F prime given to us. What is the X coordinate of the inflection point of F? So inflection point, this is, that means we have to first get to the what? Point of inflection comes from which derivative? Second derivative. So we got to go one derivative down. So if I want to go one derivative down, I got to find F double prime. To get the F double prime, what rule do we have to involve here? Product rule, yeah. So let's build the second derivative using product rule. And then we can use the calculator to see where there's a change in sign. Okay, so F prime G plus F G prime. So what's F prime going to be? Okay, G and F is going to stay the same. And then G prime, e to the x derivative, which is e to the x. So point of inflection is where not only is, uh, is your point of inflection where F total prime is equal to zero, but there has to be a change in what? Change in signs, right? Change in signs. So what if we just graph this function and look to see where it crosses the x-axis? Right? So it has to actually cross it. it has to go from uh, one side to the other side. So, so we're going to just graph this. And then we want to look for an x-intercept that changes signs or that changes sides. So it's got to hit the x-axis and it's got to go from uh, above to below the x-axis or from below to above. It can't just bounce off of the x-axis. So I'm going to go to y equals, type that second derivative function in. I'll do zoom six just to get. So it looks like I have an X intercept here, right? So in that negative region, so I'm going to do zoom one to zoom in on that region. So I see my x-intercept right there. I'll do second trace, zero. Pick a point to the left of the x-intercept, hit enter. Pick a point above the x-intercept, hit enter. Negative 3.195 or negative 3.196. Um, let f be a twice differentiable function. So uh, twice differentiable, that just means that not only is f function smooth curve, 
F prime is also a smooth curve, so it's a doubly smooth curve, meaning that um, your uh, first function, second function, first uh, function derivative, and second derivative are all going to uh, are all going to be a smooth curve. So um, F of one equals seven, F of three equals twelve. We want to find a possible value for f of five, and they tell us that f prime of x is greater than zero. Let's see if we can um, put this into words here. What is f prime of x greater than zero? What does that mean? The slope. Is yeah. positive. positive slope. And what is f double prime is less than zero? What down. does that mean? Concave what? Down. Concave down. Okay. Now, positive slope just means that um, that if I connect the points, my graph is going to con be continually rising. But concave down means that my slope is going to be continually decreasing. Right. So if I look at what concave down looks like, it means that if I were to pick points uh, consecutive to each other, each of these slopes will become less and less or, be, or moving towards a negative value. So if I pick two points here and find the slope, that could be slope three. Then the next two points may be slope two. The next two points will be slope one. But we see that there's going to be um, a rate of change of decreasing. So um, you want to pay attention to this. I think this makes sense. We can kind of see what positive slope looks like, but concave down is more um, looking at the slope of your um, of your points. Um, or looking at the pattern of your slopes. So um, it says, which of the following is a possible value for f of five? Uh, let's create uh, maybe an order pair here or a, a table of values so we can kind of uh, see some relationships here. So we know we have an order pair one comma seven. We know we have an order pair of three comma twelve. We want to figure out what could be a possible value for five for y value of five. Okay, so we can see that uh, obviously we want our y value to be continually greater, right? It's got to be more than twelve, right? Because we want our graph to be rising. So one seven, three twelve, but we want the slope to be moving, uh, well, becoming less steep. Okay, so. Any of these numbers will produce a positive slope. That's not the issue. The issue is what's going to create um, a slope pattern where it's becoming more or becoming less steep. OK, um, let's test it right now. So what we can do is um, let's find the slope between these two endpoints. Right? So the slope is just changing y over changing x. What's the slope there? Mm -hmm. Which is? Oh yeah, just five or two, right? Which is just 2.5. So we want to be able to find the next set of points where the slope is going to be decreasing, right? Maybe it's a slope of 2.5 now, but, but then we want something like less than 2.5. So um, like you said, maybe 16 could be a good fit. So let's try 16. So we find a slope there. 16 minus 12 is four. Five minus three is two. Four over two is two. And that's what we want, right? We want a slope to be continue. I mean, still positive, but it's but it's becoming less steep. If we're if we're choosing seventeen, for instance, we'll get we'll get exactly five over two, which is not right, right? We don't want the slope to be the same. We want the slope to be decreasing. Anything greater than that, the slope is going to become more steep, and that's not what we want, right? We want a slope that is less steep, okay? while still maintaining a positive slope. Good. So sixteen. Can you just like you don't know, like can you like Check you just like by like looking at the gap in between like, mm -hmm. like one to three how the x values are like staying in the same interval and then how seven plus, plus five is twelve and you can say good yeah exactly right so you can tell that the slope is decreasing yeah so you don't have to go through this if you don't want to yeah. right right but but uh but the important thing is that we understand what's going on right we know what we're looking for we're looking for something um that is going to give us um, a less steep version of the previous slope. OK, um, I feel like um, sometimes we we get a little bit. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it, whenever we see any constants 
it kind of throws us off, right? It's like, oh, what do you do when we see A or B or C? Like, we don't know how to do with that. If you see um, uh, unknown constants, they just pretend like it's a number, like a three or a five or six, and then treat it those the same way that you would if it's just a coefficient, right? It's not a variable. It's just some unknown constant that's not given to us. So it says the graph, in this graph, y equals ax cubed minus 6x squared plus bx minus 4. It could very well be, you know, 2x cubed uh, plus 5x minus 4. We just have to kind of um, just not get thrown off by those letters and just pretend like it's a number and then treat it the same way that you would a number. OK, so we know there's a point of inflection at 2, negative 2. What is the value of a plus b? So point of inflection is where what? Inevitable prime is equal to what? Yeah, it's a um, it's that's not the only thing, but it has to at least meet that criteria, right? Um, y double prime has to equal to zero. So when y double prime is equal to zero, we know that this order pair lives on it. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on a separate sheet just so I can have make sure I have enough room here. So let's work our way down to the second derivative function and see what we have. Let's find y prime first. Okay, so again, pretend like a is like a two or a three or a five. Okay, what's the derivative of ax cubed? That again? Yeah, good. Three ax squared, right? That coefficient is just going to hang out in front along with the three. Okay, next up, six x squared. Mm -hmm. What does bx become? Is it B or is it X? B, right? Imagine this is 4X, right? What's, what's the root of 4X? Oh, 4, right? So therefore, BX would just be B. Okay, how about uh, negative 4? Uh, zero. Zero, okay, good. So we're halfway there. Let's move on to the second derivative function. What's the derivative of 3AX squared? Mm -hmm. What's the derivative of 12X? What's the derivative of B? Good, zero, right? It's not a one because we do one if it's a if it's X, but B is like a number, it's like six or seven, right? The derivative of seven will be zero, so the derivative of B is going to be zero as well. So we're going to set y, prime, y double prime equal to what? Zero, right? So zero is equal to six AX minus 12. Now we know there's a point of inflection here. There's a point of inflection, they say at two, negative two. So I can plug in what and solve for a here. Two for x and solve for a, and that's one piece of the puzzle. So 12a equals 12. What's a equal to? One. All right. Now, we really can't work with y prime because they don't give us any information about y prime, but they do give us information about the order pair. So why don't we go back to the original function? And how can I solve for b now that I have my a value? Plug in uh, x equals 2, mm -hmm. and then a equals And then what else? I want to solve for b. What, uh, what else do I need to um, uh, resolve here? I don't know why that is. Yeah. Which is why negative. negative. Good. So now we have all the pieces that we need, right? We we uh, we use the second derivative to get to one unknown value. Now that we have that unknown value, the remaining value is b. So replace two and negative two for x and y. And then now it's just plugging in and just solving uh, with this equation. Again, we don't have any information from y prime, so we really can't use y prime to um, to help us with this. But we do have our original equation. So replace y with negative 2, replace a with 1, replace x with 2.
And then it's asking for a plus b, right? So a plus b is 1 plus 9, which is 10. OK, two more. Number six, uh, a particle moves along the X axis is particle motion problem. Position is given by X of T. What is the velocity of the particle when the acceleration is zero? So let's go ahead and find our way down to the second derivative function, which is acceleration. We'll set acceleration equal to zero, find that critical point, and then we can plug in for the velocity function. So, um, hey. All right, what's my velocity function here? Sine of T becomes. Uh, just positive, right? Three cosine of t, right? T squared becomes two t. Okay, we'll come back to our velocity function. We're going to need it later, but first we have to. Uh, our connection is that acceleration is equal to zero. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to our acceleration function. What's the derivative of three cosine of t? Cosine becomes what? Yeah, that's right. Negative three sine t plus. Two. Okay. We want to find the time when acceleration is zero, so we can just plug zero in for acceleration. Now this one is hard to solve by hand, so that's why this is a calculator question. We're just going to graph this and look for the what? Yeah, look for the x-intercept, yeah. If we can find the time where the acceleration is zero, then we can use that time to figure out what is the velocity at that moment. So we'll say y is equal to negative three sine of t, or negative three sine of x plus two. Zoom six. Okay. Uh, we're Uh, we can just find the value that's closest to zero here. Um, so, um, but any of these um, times would work because um, we're going to get the same acceleration. So, uh, I'm going to do a second trace uh, zero. I'll pick a point to the left of my first x intercept, and then I'll pick a point to the right of my first x intercept, hit enter. I get 0.729. So, we know that acceleration is zero at 0.729 seconds. All right, how can I find the acceleration? Yeah, that into, into what? Plugging in for t. Mm -hmm. For which equation? For the acceleration. Wait, but what's it asking for though? What is the? What is for loss? Yeah, so. In velocity. Yeah, into the velocity function. Yeah, so just replace the t with 0.729 and figure out what is the velocity at that moment in time.
last one. Um, the second derivative uh, is given by F double prime. And the graph of F double prime is shown above. For what value of X is this graph of point of inflection? So if this is the second derivative graph, where do we look for points of inflection? Is it the peaks and valleys or is it the x-intercepts? X-intercept. This is the f double prime graph. If it was f prime graph, then the peaks and valleys would be would be good. But f double prime, we want to find out where f double prime is equal to zero, right? So equal to zero is x-intercept. So we have a couple of x-intercepts here. But are all of these are all candidates for points of inflection, but are all of these points of inflection? What needs to happen for points of inflection? Change in signs, right? So what are our points of inflections then? Only at what? A and zero, right? Not at E because E, there's no change in signs. It's negative to the left, it's negative to the right. So concave down, concave down, we want uh, a change in signs. So A and zero. Okay, uh, if you guys can show me. 13 through 16. Okay. Um, I'm uh, let me talk to Yeah, yeah, let me check that. All right, don't get your phones. Um, 